Thou preparest a table before me, Wild Harvest Edibles, Part 54. An important note, as you navigate any health challenge, it is always recommended that you partner with a medical practitioner that shares your philosophy of the care of the human body in disease and in health. The information shared in this presentation is meant to educate and improve your wellness toolbox and aid in returning to health if sick and maintaining good health when well. It should not be construed as medical advice, simply as tools that have been successfully used by others in similar situations. As always, investigate and verify any treatment, protocol, or procedure for yourself, not blindly accepting anything without due diligence. Thomas Edison said that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will instruct his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. In 1885, in Testimonies for the Church, it was written, There are many ways of practicing the healing art, but there is only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties. Pure air and water, cleanliness, a proper diet, purity of life, and a firm trust in God are remedies for the want of which thousands are dying. Yet these remedies are going out of date because their skillful use requires work that the people do not appreciate. Fresh air, exercise, pure water, and clean, sweet premises are within the reach of all, with but little expense. But drugs are expensive, both in the outlay of means and the effect produced upon the system. In 3 John 1 verse 2 stated, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. If our soul is prospering, we can prosper in health as well as in all other things. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Today we'll be looking first at Japanese knotweed, Polygonum cuspidatum. <clears throat> it's a perennial and it's very fast growing. It is uh, semi-woody and rhizomatous, which basically means that it spreads by an underground rhizome or root and its areas of growth will increase over time. It grows in dense leafy thickets. Uh, its stems are similar in nature to bamboo in the sense that they are hollow and jointed. That joint is essentially where the leaves come from a node, or the branches, so it's a thick node. And <clears throat> the young shoots are red. The stems become woody with age as they're first coming up out of the ground. They're soft and pliable, and that's the portion that is uh, eaten. So it prefers moist habitat, so riverbanks, wetlands, lake shores, and it can grow to five to eight feet tall. So it can be very, very tall. And again, it has those distinct bamboo-like appearing nodes on the dry, hollow, woody stems. The flower comes in clusters on a, a spike up to six inches long, and they form on leaf axles, so all the way along the, the length of the, of the bush. They flower in late summer. And they have individual flowers that are approximately eighth inch across, so the very tiny flowers on a flower spike. They can be greenish, whitish, or pinkish, and they five, have five petals. So you can see how they kind of march along where the leaves attach the stem. That's where there's also a flower cluster that comes out. The female flowers are small and uh, three-angled. Black fruit is commonly or not commonly seen as a part of them, so typically they don't fruit, uh, but they are occasionally seen. So the leaf is organized alternately on the stem, so every other position on the stem has a leaf associated with it. It can be up to two and a half or two to five inches wide. They're broad, you can see here in the picture on the right, oval, and have pointed tips. <clears throat> they have a hairless with a smooth margin, so there are no teeth on the edges of the leaves. In the picture on the lower right, you can see some new spring uh, shoots coming up. The young leaves are edible as well as the young shoots. You can see the node-like appearances there that may give it kind of that bamboo-like characteristic. Right now, they're going to be uh, solid and pliable, but as they grow larger, they will become hollow and become much more woody. And that, that, at that point, they will not be, not be edible. But early in the spring, as they're coming up, uh, they come back every year. Sometimes you can see them by the evidence by their old growth stands just left over from the year before if they haven't been kind of cleaned up as a part of a yard area. 
if they're more in a wild stand, you'll see those old woody stems as being evidence of their presence. So harvesting them, you want to eat the young shoots and the unfurled leaves. So you can see the lower right, that's kind of the stand that you would begin, you'd be consuming uh, those shoots there. Uh, springtime, before they get woody, and you can use them like asparagus or as vegetables. You can also use them in a similar fashion to rhubarb in pies and jams. You want to pre-soak them for a day and parboil them before use. They have a tendency to expand their territory and uh, as such they are often considered invasive. So just be cautious where you choose to use them because people may have attempted to eradicate them by spraying them. So make sure that what you're collecting for eating are free of pesticides and herbicides rather. So here's a recipe. You can see the flower clusters on the top there again and you can see how large it is in this, this picture here on the lower portion. It's quite a large stand there, as tall as the young man that's standing there. And they have again that reddish tinge to the shoots as they're just coming out of the ground, greenish to reddish. So steamed Japanese knotweed. So two cups of soaked or parboiled shoots and leaves, uh, one cup prepared asparagus and spinach. Uh, and then you can make a dressing of two tablespoons of lemon juice, uh, a teaspoon of garlic, and a tablespoon of honey. Just mix that together. Steam the greens and then toss them along with the dressing. Some medicinal properties of the Japanese knotweed. You can see again on the, the diagram on the right, just the alternating presentation of the, of the leaves. And then from each axle, that's the point where the leaf joins the stem is where the flower clusters come from. And then there's a pencil drawing there of the tiny flowers. So the roots uh, can help with symptoms of Lyme disease and SARS, Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Um, it's uh, billed as a type of virus, but it could have other underlying sources as well. So look at the, the map here, <clears throat> it's range map. Uh, it doesn't happen to be in the lower, the lower United States and the central provinces of Canada, but all across Alaska, down across the western United States, Pacific Northwest, and across to the east and eastern provinces. Our next thing that we'll look at is Polystichum munitum, which is the sword fern, also known as the holly fern. It's a perennial as it grows back every year. And actually it uh, maintained its fronds, the older, more mature fronds are present year round, but each year there are new uh, fiddlehead fronds that uh, are uh, produced by the plant. <clears throat> so it prefers well-drained coniferous forests and uh, the fronds grow from a rhizome, an underground stem. They have reddish scales on their fiddleheads that come up and it arches into a mound that is uh, the productive area of the, of the fern. So the fronds can be two to four feet long and wide. So they can be huge. They can be just very tall in a given, in a given area. The rhizome and the rachis of the fiddleheads uh, is covered in reddish brown scales. And we'll see a picture of that here uh, a little bit later. The underside of the leaf you can see has the sori uh, prominently displayed on the bottom of more mature leaves. It was considered a starvation food, so basically a lot of work for the for the food value that is obtained from it, but is still uh, good to know about as a uh, food source because in some places where it grows, it's quite prevalent. There's a lot of it, so that can be helpful. So the spores, you can see the bottom side of the leaf here, they are found in these little sori. So there are spores that are inside of that. They're covered by a translucent in insidium, which is kind of a covering. 32 to 64 spores, and they are along the leaf margins and will be released as the plant dries or becomes uh, drier. And then and it'll need a moist area in order to uh, grow into the sporophyte <clears throat> as it advances into growing into a new plant. So the leaf is very dark green. The picture here is kind of a lighter green, but it's a, a dark a dark green fronds having up to 100 leaflets. This particular plant could have had its fronds removed and these are the fresh from the new season. So the fresh new season fronds are gonna be lighter colored as compared to the more mature, longer lasting fronds that have been there from seasons before. They're very uh, lance shaped and have fine toothed edges and have a, a lobe on the edge. that looks like a little sword hilt. I'll show you a picture of that here in a little while. The mature plants can have up to 100 fronds and can be up to four feet long. 
So the lower picture there is a mound of fresh sword fern. Uh, fiddleheads coming up that's being made. See the covered in the reddish scales. The upper picture is a picture of a portion of the rhizome and a little kind of a moisture sack. The rhizomes are fairly tiny, uh, but they can again be used. So the roots need to be roasted. So a roasting pit would be a great place to do that or in an oven. Uh, harvest them in the spring prior to the presence of the, the new growth beginning. Then cook and peel the roots. So cooking them allows the peeling of the roots to be more easily accomplished. <clears throat> and then, then you can roast them. Uh, they are not thick, so again, the effort put into uh, preparing them as far as their nutrition, that's why it was considered a, a starvation food because it's a lot of work to get the little food, the value that is there. So you can make a sword fern stir fry. Uh, you can boil the fern tubers and others that may be available that you have found till they're tender and then peel them. Uh, chop and saute with garlic and a touch of sea salt and a cast on uh, cast iron pan. Uh, oil typically is of, of uh, less value, not less value, but uh, less prominent in a situation where you may just be in the field. So just simple water is a great way to saute. And then you're also not uh, utilizing uh, potentially damaged uh, free oils in your in your cooking. And then season them to taste with whatever seasoning you have. It could be salt or it could be uh, perhaps some onions or leeks or something like that. So over here on the right, you can see where the arrow comes down uh, and it attaches at the stem at the leaf there. There's a prominent lobe that is hidden by the leaf below it, which, interesting left, doesn't have that lobe quite as prominently displayed. But the one on the right, two on the right there, have that extra lobe, which is essentially the little hilt on the sword of the sword fern. So from a medicinal standpoint, the fern fronds can help heal sores. The shoots can be chewed and help the sore throat. So that would be the fiddleheads. The spores rubbed on stinging nettle can lessen the sting. Had a student this last week who stung himself and had some nettle right by and said it worked instantly. So that's a little field, a field report. Um, haven't uh, personally tried that and uh, just uh, remains to be seen how well that works. So the frond tea, uh, you can make use that as a poultice or as a wash for boils and sores. The young shoots uh, can be chewed for wound cancer. And the rhizome, a root decoction. So remember, decoction is where you would take the portion of the plant that is woody or more dense and then uh, boil it in water as, until that water is reduced by about half for several hours. And then the, the extracted components are used as a treatment for dandruff in this case. And on the bottom picture, you can see the mature spores on the bottom side. You, again, you can see the, the bump out of the little lobe on each leaf that is considered the hilt on the sword, which is each individual leaflet on the entire frond. Our third species that we'll look at is Lilium columbianum or Lancifolium, depending on where you are, the tiger lily. And it's a native perennial, it's native to the west, can grow up to five feet from one bulb. It prefers moist sites and well-drained sites. <clears throat> and in a hike here in the Pacific Northwest, this is a beautiful little flower to find, kind of alpine areas, even lower areas, just a, a neat surprise of splash of color. The flower is large, it's typically bright orange, has obvious brown spots that kind of turn back, as you can see, towards the sepals, displaying the, the anthers prominently and the, the stigma and style of the pistil uh, can reach up to two inches in size. Multiple flowers, as you can see on the, the lower picture, from the same stem, kind of uh, branch off there. And like a daylily, you can eat the, eat the pods and the flowers. So this is very softly scented. It flowers from June to August, and uh, the, they will be harvested. The bulbils, after they've uh, uh, flowered, can also be harvested and eaten when dark and dry. So the leaves are lance-shaped, uh, light green in color, and whirled up the upright stem, which we'll see here in a bit. So again, the, the bulbs and the flower pods are, are edible. Harvest the bulbs in cool times when the vegetation is dead. So this would facilitate, or necessitate rather, needing to mark where they are so that you can return and harvest them so you know where they are. 
The bulb has a bitter chestnut taste upon cooking, so it's starchy like a potato, and it can, so you can substitute it for any root vegetable. You can see a picture of the bulb here, and the leaves coming up whirled around the stem on the right side, and then the, the flower uh, bulbul and or bud that is getting ready to come out at different stages of the plant's life cycle. So a recipe, you can make a, a rice bake, a tiger lily rice bake. So one and a half cups of washed rice, one cup of diced tiger lily bulb. You use a cup of diced pumpkin, a cup of broccoli, a cup of chopped cauliflower, carrot, onion, a cup of soy milk, and two cups of vegetable broth. Spread the rice in the bottom of a casserole dish and add the vegetables. Pour over the thick soy milk and vegetable broth and then cover and cook for at 400 for one hour. You can add nutritional yeast for added flavor. So this is a beautiful picture of a tiger lily. You can see its uh, petals back. It's characteristic orange color with the brown spots all speckled over it like freckles with the pollen-laden anthers exposed uh, prominently from the face of the flower. And the whorled leaves around the upright stem here on the right and the multiple flowers, uh, rather small, on the top of the tiger lily uh, plant www.preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com is a great resource for finding and uh, learning more about edible wild plants as well as other uh, homesteading topics and topics on the time of trouble.